Welcome to everybody and it's uh, great to have you here in this special afternoon and the launching of our Jewish Christian victims of the Holocaust and to Kelvin Crombie and so Kelvin I'm not going to take any more of your time and uh, why don't you come on up and uh, I know we'll be blessed in what we're about to hear. Well thank you Margaret for your welcome and for the provision of this wonderful venue for the Perth launch of this publication, uh, Basili and Anna Yotch, uh, Jewish Christian Victims of the Holocaust. An undertaking such as this could never be done alone. It is actually the hardest project I've worked on by Longstreet. There have been many who have encouraged and supported me throughout this project and for each and every one of you I say a very sincere thank you. I will not name you by name because I always forget somebody. I would also like to acknowledge those present who are personally connected to the subject of the Holocaust, especially the children of Holocaust survivors. As this presentation coincides with the anniversary of Kristallnacht, I'm mindful that this is a very difficult time for you and for Jewish people in general. From the outset, I want to make it very clear that although I'm giving this presentation on a Holocaust-related subject, I certainly do not presume to understand the mechanics of the Holocaust, as that is just far too big and broad for any individual to grasp. One thing I can tell you though, this is the most difficult research study I have ever undertaken. As the Holocaust is the totality of all that is evil in mankind. I've already suffered several meltdowns, if I can call it that, from this undertaking, overwhelmed by the evil and darkness associated with it. Jeremiah was right when he wrote, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately evil. Who can know it? The reason I am giving this presentation about Basile and Anna Yotch, Jewish Christian victims of the Holocaust, is due to a request two and a half years ago by my former colleague, David Pelleggi, director of Christchurch Jerusalem, and director of the Conrad Schick Library and Archive, which is there. David wanted me to record the history of the Jewish followers of Jesus during the Holocaust, and especially to determine the names of those who lost their lives. Christchurch is owned by an organization named CMJ, Church's Ministry Among Jewish People, and many Jewish Christian victims of the Holocaust were associated with CMJ, especially in Poland. One of those victims was Basili Jotch. This joint research project between Heritage Resources Proprietary Limited, in which I am involved, and the Conrad Schick Library is entitled The Jewish Non-Aryan Christian Research Study. It's a bit of a mouthful. I'm also indebted to others, such as Mitch Glazer, Richard Harvey, and Geshem Nadel, who are also interested in the same subject matter. The term non-Aryan Christian was used by the Nazis to classify Jewish people who were associated with the church. These Jewish people were often completely assimilated, while some regarded themselves as Hebrew Christians or Jewish Christians. At that time, Jewish followers of Jesus were not known as Messianic Jews. Our desire in this research study is to record details about these people and to honour their memory. How many people today even know that there were possibly tens of thousands of such victims, let alone honour their memory? These victims of the Holocaust were triply, often triply maligned by many in the general population because they were viewed as being Jewish, by many Jewish people 
because they were viewed as being converts and apostates and therefore not Jewish anymore. And even by some in the church, as they were viewed as being non-Aryan Christians, that is Jewish, and therefore not welcome in the church. The Israeli historian Chavi Ben Susson wrote of this group of Jewish people for the Journal of Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Israel, and I quote, it is a basic Jewish principle that even a sinful Jew still remains a Jew. Thus a Jew remains affiliated with the Jewish community at large, for better or worse, irrespective of his or her actions. During World War II, this tenet of the faith took on practical significance. With the occupation of Warsaw, she wrote, the Jews of the city and its surroundings fell into the clutches of the Nazis. However, some 2,000 converts to Christianity who, despite their non-Jewish way of life, were perceived by the Nazis as full-fledged Jews based on a racial definition of a Jew, were also at risk." End of quote. A Hebrew Christian pastor and later a leading Messianic Jewish academic named Jacob Yotch wrote of this group in 1941, and I quote, from what we know of conditions in Poland at the present moment, the lot of the Jewish Christian believers must be even worse than that of the Jews. The Nazis, who condemn every Jew as a pariah, irrespective of creed, have probably driven the Hebrew Christians back into the Jewish ghetto. But within the ghetto, the Hebrew Christian is again a pariah, this time in the eyes of the Jews. He can scarcely expect any help or sympathy from the Jewish community. His plight must be difficult. Thus, the young Hebrew Christian groups in Poland are going through a time of testing and great trial. Their temptation to deny or renounce Christ must be great. Some of them will probably lapse. We pray that many may endure and remain faithful. End of quote. The publication being launched today looks in part at these Jewish or Hebrew Christians, mostly through the lens of one Hebrew Christian family, the Yotch family from Poland. I have no personal connection to the subject matter. I am not Jewish and therefore had no family members who experienced the Holocaust. During my 24 or so years in Israel, however, I came to know many Messianic Jews including the two pastors of the Messianic congregation I was part of, who were children of Holocaust survivors. But when I was a young boy growing up in Babikin in rural Western Australia, I became aware of the Holocaust, especially by reading about it initially in Pernell's History of the Second World War Encyclopedia. There was one whole section dedicated to Hitler's final solution to the Jewish problem. As a young boy, I was intrigued by the horrific photographs attached to the text, and a question became entrenched in my young mind. Who were these people, and why were they being treated so badly? Also by the age of 10, I became aware of Israel, due to the Six-Day War and the presence of an Israeli family, the Fleshers, on a nearby farm at Babikin. On one occasion, while on a visit to the local news agency in Corrigan, when I was going in to purchase either a football or a cricket magazine, I noticed a, noticed a book entitled Treblinka. Treblinka was one of the five Nazi death camps. I purchased that book instead. Now, what 12-year-old boy with no Jewish background does that? Then in my late teen years, I read such books as Myler 18 about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and QB7, also about the Holocaust, books which were purchased by my brother Grant and cousin Lindsay. Seeds were being sown relating to the subject matter. 
while gallivanting around Europe in 1978, I visited a number of Holocaust-related sites in Germany, Poland, and the former Soviet Union, including Dachau concentration camp and Warsaw, including the former ghetto where Myla 18 had been located. When I finally arrived in Israel in early 1979, the reality of the Holocaust became even more profound. Wherever I went, I met people whose entire families had perished, including those of my kibbutz parents. These were the remnant. One of the first places I went to in Jerusalem was Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum. It was not an easy place to visit, but over the following years, I found myself returning there often. That question, why? was always there, but there was never a desire to try to answer that question. After becoming a follower of Jesus, in 1981, I began to live in Jerusalem and had for a short time looked after a Holocaust survivor. This man had been beaten, badly beaten by the Nazis, yet had survived, although he was mentally damaged ever since. Later, I worked in a psychiatric and geriatric hospital in Jerusalem, and twice a week I was invited to go into the closed ward to assist with the dance and music therapy group. Numerous Holocaust survivors were located in this ward. This was a somewhat challenging and occasionally a frightening experience, but one that I will always remember. Each year, everyone living in Israel was confronted and reminded of the actuality of the Holocaust in a special way on Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Day. Holocaust deniers really are from another planet. And I say that earnestly. Then in 2006, I joined with David Pelegi on a tour of Eastern Europe and visited numerous Holocaust-related sites including Auschwitz. Visiting an actual death camp is quite different from visiting either Yad Vashem or a concentration camp. At this point, I should explain the difference between a death camp and the concentration or internment camp. There were literally hundreds of concentration, internment or work camps spread throughout Nazi-occupied Europe. Many Jewish people were held in those camps, but also many non-Jewish people as well, including Polish intellectuals and Catholic priests, Jehovah Witnesses, Roma and Sinta peoples, the Gypsies, homosexuals and political opponents. Lexi's grandfather, A.A.L. Rutgers, for instance, was a political opponent of the Nazis in the Netherlands and was interned for some time in Buchenwald. And you'll see her on the picture that comes up. While her uncle Lex was a member of the Dutch underground and was interned at Sachsenhausen. But there were five specific camps designated to murder Jewish people. These were Auschwitz, which had initially been a Polish army barracks, Chelmno, which was mostly a mansion and burial grounds in nearby forests, as well as Belzec, Sobibor and Treblinka. Once while on, a, while on a visit to Warsaw, I took the train out to Treblinka and spent a half a day walking through where the camp had been and the surrounding forest. It was one of the eeriest experiences of my life. Between 700,000 to 900,000 Jewish people were sadistically murdered in that location. But despite such visits and exposure, I still had no desire to get too close to the subject of the Holocaust. No desire to go past a certain point. When you do investigative research, you will often invest yourself in the subject matter in order to better understand the mechanics of what you are researching. This way, you can hopefully communicate not just head knowledge, but something from deep down here communicating a message with passion and understanding. When I was doing the research for the Light Horse and Anzac involvement in the Middle East, for instance, 
I often needed to take some risks and make a considerable investment of time and finances to go and locate relevant battle sites, etc. And this way be in a better place to communicate the subject matter. Concerning the Holocaust, however, I didn't want to get too close to the subject matter because, well, who would voluntarily choose to better understand the mechanics of the most heinous and demonic crime in world history? But then in April 2018, I felt it was right to accept David Pelleggi's request to undertake this research study. I felt the time was right to be willing to go past that certain point, to step out of my comfort zone and try to discover information about these Jewish people who had the same faith as myself and had been victims of the Holocaust. From the outset though, I'll, I felt disqualified to undertake this study. How can I, from a Gentile background, who never personally experienced these horrific events, how can I research, write, and speak about them? The subject of the Holocaust is just so terrible, especially for the Jewish people. You see, if any Jewish person happened to be in Europe then, and this included allied POWs, they would all be under the sentence of death. Can we Gentiles comprehend this? The Jewish people have to constantly live with this reality. People can hate them and want to harm them just because they are Jewish. The Holocaust is a difficult and contentious matter. But so too is the subject of Jewish followers of Jesus, especially for the Jewish community and also to a lesser extent for sections of the church. This research study and present publication deals with both of these matters together. And hence you might know why this was not an easy subject to work on. Since undertaking this research study, I've spent countless hours reading and researching at home, as well as doing some research trips here in Australia and conducting three very intense overseas research trips. The first of these was in mid-2018 to Israel and included considerable time in the Konrad Schick Library and in Yad Vashem. Then it was on to Poland for a Holocaust-related tour organised by David Pelegi. This tour included time in a number of former ghettos, especially Warsaw, as well as visiting, visiting various burial sites in the forests. Many people are not aware that perhaps two million or more Jewish people were actually shot, mostly in Ukraine and Belarus, and were buried in mass graves in forests or at Jewish cemeteries. Many were also murdered in this way in Poland, and there are many such mass graves there as well. On this tour, four of the five death camps were also visited, namely Treblinka, Sobibor, Beltsek, and Auschwitz, as well as the notorious concentration camp of Majdanek near Lublin. The second research trip was to the UK, Canada, and the USA in late 2018, when I visited about 17 archives and collections, mostly from British and American evangelical organizations, which had functioned in Europe prior to the Second World War. There was a large number of Jewish Christians spread throughout Europe pre-1939. Although the majority were associated with the Roman Catholic Church, there were also many associated with the Orthodox, the Unit, Unit, which is the Greek Catholic Church, and the Protestant Church. There were also many evangelical Protestant missionary societies from Britain, the United States, and numerous European countries, operating throughout Europe and especially in Poland. Many of these societies have historic collections and archives. Two of those archives are located in Toronto, Canada, 
and were related to Jacob Yotch. Jacob had been the minister of the large Anglican-based Hebrew Christian community in Warsaw, in Poland, before the war. That community, numbering over 100, was almost completely destroyed by the Nazis and their sympathisers, either in the Warsaw Ghetto or in Treblinka. This community of Hebrew Christians was associated with CMJ. Prior to World War II, CMJ operated two ministry centres in Poland, one in Warsaw and the other in Lvov, which is now Lviv in Ukraine, where Jacob's parents, Basile and Anna, and brother Jan lived, and where Pavel, or Paul, another brother, later served. Jacob Jotch was outside of Poland the day the war broke out, on the 1st of September 1939 and could not return to Warsaw. He remained in Britain and therefore survived the Holocaust. When Poland was defeated by the Germans, it was divided into three regions. One region was annexed by the Germans. One region, which included Lvov, was annexed by the Soviets. And one region named the General Government, which included Warsaw, remained under German administration. While one of Jacob's brothers, Jersey, remained in Warsaw and more than likely endured the, the ghetto experience, the remainder of the family were in Lvov, except for Jacob, who was in London. Although life was difficult under the Soviets, it was manageable. But then on the 22nd of June 1941, the Germans invaded the Soviet Union and then life suddenly became unbearable for the Jewish people in that region including the Yotch family. In order to survive, Basili was hidden in a woodshed at the home of a Gentile Christian from their evangelical congregation. Anna remained in the house, which had been commandeered by the Germans, and passed herself off as a Polish Christian. They lived under these circumstances for over two and a half years, until, unfortunately, Basile was discovered in February 1944 and executed. Two and a half years hidden in a woodshed. Can you relate to that? How could someone retain their mental faculties in that situation? Besides the fact Anna was supplying him with food during this period of time and placed herself also in constant danger. How did the Gestapo agents know that Basile was Jewish? because they conducted a body search. There is no greater sign of a person's Jewishness than the sign of circumcision. And that's how they knew he was Jewish. In that encounter, Anna was badly beaten by the Gestapo agents, yet survived the ordeal, but was paralyzed from the waist downwards thereafter. After the war, and aided by her son, Pavel, or Paul, Anna quite miraculously managed to get out of Soviet-controlled Poland and made it to Britain, where she lived with Jacob and his family. Then in 1956, Jacob moved with his family, including Anna, to Canada, and hence the reason for Jacob's archives being located there. While in Toronto, I met Jacob's son, Philip, at his sister's house, and he brought out a lot of material related to his family, some of which they had only just recently located. Included was a large, thick file, of which Philip said something like this. I don't know what to do with this file. It's all in German. I've even thought of throwing it out, or words to that effect. Thankfully, Philip did not throw that file out. Virtually all of the above-related information was found in what I call the German file. During all the years that Jacob had been caring for his partly paralysed mother, Anna, he had not received any government assistance. But then in 1957, or thereabouts, Jacob attempted to obtain financial compensation from the German government for the injuries sustained by Anna at the hands of the Gestapo agents. As you could well imagine, the German government would not or would want to ascertain if Jacob's claim was true. 
And so they had a legal team attached to the case. Jacob also had a legal representative in Canada. This file contained all of the correspondence relating to these deliberations spread out over many years. Despite my poor German, as I flicked through the 200 or so pages, I noticed lots of biographical material. These pages were then photographed and later given to Deborah Pelegi to translate into English, which she did over a period of time. The analyzing of all the material from the Yotch collection and the German file, though needed to wait. And the waiting was when the COVID caught up with us. The third major research trip was a solid 10 week period in 2019, uh, sorry, which took in France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, Poland, Austria, and the Czech Republic. On that trip, I visited all five death camps, including the Helmno camp, and literally dozens of other former ghettos, concentration and detention camps, museums, memorials and libraries associated with the subject matter in all of the above mentioned countries. Thus far, I've collected thousands of pages and photographs of research material. Early on, I had difficulty knowing how to catalogue the materials, not so much physically, but thematically, so that I would not get lost. As a result, I have developed two models to assist me. The first model relates to the Jewish non-Aryan Christians. In the Nazi worldview, there were Aryans and there were non-Aryans. Germans were Aryans or as otherwise defined as Nordic or even Caucasian peoples. Jews, as well as Roma and Sinta peoples, were non-Aryans, that is, non-Europeans. According to the Nazi race laws from Nuremberg in 1935, the Jotsch family were 100% Jewish. Yet the entire Jotsch family were also 100% Jewish followers of Jesus and were part of the church, albeit in Poland. To the Nazis, all German institutions were, fur to, were to further the Nazi world view. The church was one such institution. So it had to be brought under Nazi control. A tough ideological battle then occurred within the German church between those holding to a Nazi worldview and those upholding a biblical, evangelical worldview. This struggle is associated with Martin Niemöller and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. What then about the Jewish people who were associated with the church? For the Nazis, they were Jewish because the issue was not one of faith, but one of bloodline. Oftentimes in my research, mention is made of the converts, or some other terms, many, of course, the Jewish non-Aryan Christians. Some of these references could be quite derogatory. However, I've discovered that there are at least seven categories of Jewish non-Aryan Christians. This is my own model. One, someone who was genuinely convinced before the 1st of September 1939 that Jesus was the promised Messiah of Israel. Two, someone who converted and was baptised and became a member of the church, mostly for socio-economic reasons, seeing this as being the best avenue for progressing in the host Gentile or Christian society. Three, someone who converted and was baptised into the church because they were marrying a Gentile or Christian spouse. This person may or may not have had a genuine faith in Jesus as the Messiah. Four, someone whose parents or grandparents had converted and were baptised from categories one, two and three. And who now, as a second or third generation person outside of the Jewish community, did not perceive themselves as being a member of the community of Israel. They were, for all intents and purposes, fully assimilated into the Gentile world. Five, someone who converted and was baptised after the 1st of September 1939, 
due to wartime expediency, perceiving this as bettering their chances of survival. There were instances where baptismal certificates were issued which provided the Jewish recipients with the opportunity to survive, and many did. Some from this category might therefore or thereafter have continued in the church, while others in time rejoined the Jewish community. Six, someone who was a child after the 1st of September 1939 was entrusted to Christian individuals and institutions for safekeeping. This child, or this group, created considerable angst after the war as some of the children did not want to return to the Jewish community and some of the Christian people or institutions did not want to return the child to the Jewish community. And number seven, someone who after the 1st of September 1939, in the midst of the war, was genuinely convinced that Jesus was the Messiah of Israel. There may well have been more sub Groupings, you might say. But this is my working model and this publication as well as my general research. My second working model relates to how the Holocaust happened. In brief, the Holocaust was a plan of the Nazi German leadership to systematically and completely murder some 11 million Jewish people in Europe and surrounding nations. But I do not believe this was their initial objective when they gained power in 1933. There were, as I can see, seven phases or stages of the Holocaust. These are not rigid and there was overlap between them and this is my own personal working model. Phase one, until 1933, foundations laid. The Nazi world view was built upon foundations which ran very deep into history. Those foundations included historic anti-Semitism as found in the established churches, including the teachers of some of the church fathers and Martin Luther. The Nazis later used sayings from the church fathers and from Luther to justify their racial policies against the Jewish people. Then there were other contributing factors, such as rampant nationalism, especially of the pan-German variety, the influence of the age of reason, the enlightenment, especially on the Protestant church, which led in some places to a more liberal form of Christianity, the influence of the occult. Some Nazis even wanted to return to the pre-Christian Germany, and they invoked the ancient Germanic deities. There's a lesson on that for us today in our country. A very strong influence upon the Nazi worldview was Darwinism and its emphasis upon superior and inferior races of people. And it's more. Phase two, 1933 to 1939, intimidation, exploitation and emigration. Following the Nazi takeover of power in Germany and later Austria and Czechoslovakia, they increasingly pressured and exploited the Jewish people, denouncing and delegitimizing them and encouraging them to leave the Reich. There were three major significant events in this process. There were many, but I've brought out three. The passing of the law forbidding Jewish people from working in the civil service in April 1933. The passing of the Nuremberg Laws in 1935 which basically eradicated Jewish citizenship in Germany, and a nationwide pogrom on the 9th and 10th of November 1938, known as Kristallnacht. Phase three, 1939-40, the Lublin and ghettoization plan. This was the policy after the Germans invaded Poland on the 1st of September 1939 and div divided the defeated Poland. The Nazis planned to move all the Jewish people under their control to a specific area within the general government region around the city of Lublin. Initially though, most Jewish people in captured Poland were relocated into ghettos, the largest being in Warsaw. This Lublin and ghettoization plan in time became, became quite unworkable 
and a new solution was sought. Phase four, 1940 to 41, the Madagascar plan. I had never heard about this plan until I began researching this research study. Particularly when I read of Jewish people, including non-Aryan Christians, being taken from Western Germany all the way down to the south of France and placed in a large detention camp named Gurs at the base of the Pyrenees. From there, they would be moved to the French colonial territory of Madagascar, the first of all four million Jewish people then under Nazi control, one million a year. The person entrusted with, this, with developing this plan was Adolf Eichmann. Last year, while on a CMJ-related uh, speaking trip sorry, to France, I went down to that region and located Gurs. Although there was little infrastructure remaining, there is, though, a very large cemetery there with mostly Jewish graves, which is quite unusual in the context of the Holocaust. I even found evidence of congregations for both Jewish Catholics and Jewish Protestants at Gurs. The Madagascar plan ultimately failed because the Germans could not defeat the British, who controlled the seas. So a new policy was required for the Jewish people. Phase five, 1941, the Eastern Plan. When the Germans invaded the Soviet Union on the 22nd of June, 1941, in Operation Barbarossa, they had orders to shoot Soviet commissars who were Bolshevik representatives. As Hitler equated Bolshevism with the Jews, this order included the indiscriminate shooting of Jewish males of a certain age group. It was most likely at this time that Basile was hidden in the woodshed. The Eastern Plan also involved the transfer of Jewish people in Western Europe to captured regions of the Soviet Union. They would later be removed over the Ural Mountains into Asia and therefore out of Europe thus satisfying Hitler's desire to create a Judenfrei Europe, a Jewish free Europe. Phase 6, 1941 to 42. Initial implementation of genocide. But several months after the invasion, the Nazi murder squads, especially the Einsatzgruppen, began to indiscriminately shoot Jewish women, children and older men. This was an ominous sign. It was then that Himmler, the head of the SS, ordered that other methods of mass murder, apart from shooting, be developed. This resulted in the development initially of the gas vans, which were used at Helmno, and ultimately of the permanent gassing facilities at the other four concentration, or death camps, sorry, namely Auschwitz, Belzec, Treblinka and Sobibor. Phase 7, 1942 to 45, complete implementation of genocide. The final phase began with a conference in Wannsee House near Berlin on the 20th of January 1942. At this conference, the decision was made to systematically murder all 11 million Jewish people in Europe and surrounding regions. No Jewish person would be spared. Simon Rufus Isaacs, the Marquess of Reading, who wrote the foreword of the book, told me that he was earmarked for death even as a small child living in Britain, solely because he was Jewish. Thankfully, he said, the Germans did not conquer Britain. Following the Wannsee Conference, Jewish people throughout Europe were transported to one of the five death camps, or even murdered in other ways, especially through shooting. The murder of the remaining millions of Jewish people in Poland was named Operation Reinhardt. The Jewish non-Aryan Christians were caught up in these various phases of the Holocaust. These two models, as presented above, have enabled me to place much of the information gleaned in a manner which has assisted me in part to better understand the subject I'm researching which by now you can probably ascertain is a very deep and dark subject. 
But as you could well imagine also, there is then the challenge of being able to communicate this information in such a way that the message can be understood. How can this be done? After returning from the extended research trip in 2019, I had literally thousands more visuals and photographs to sift through. The first task was to compile the names of all the Jewish followers of Jesus from the Netherlands who were victims of the Holocaust. It was seen that there were at least 431 Jewish non-Aryan Christians from the Netherlands who died, mostly in Auschwitz and Sobibor. Then I again looked over the materials from the Jotsch collection, including the translated documents from the German file. It was then that I realised that here was the possibility of communicating the broader subject matter by following the lives of this entire family of Jewish followers of Jesus from Poland. Here was a family who, according to the Nazi laws promulgated at Nuremberg in 1935, were 100% Jewish, yet the entire Jokic family were also 100% followers of Jesus. After receiving the endorsement and permission from Philip Jotsch, this task then began in earnest earlier this year. In the book, there are a number of introductory chapters which endeavour to lay a foundation for understanding how and why some Jewish people followed Jesus as the Messiah and why most Jewish people did not how and why Jewish people arrived in Poland, and how and why the Jotsch family came to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. These chapters also endeavour to paint a picture of life for the Jotsch family within the region of Poland during the years leading up to the outbreak of World War II. Throughout the chapters on the Second World War period, mention is often made of the challenges facing the Jotsch family, as well as the sufferings and challenges of other Jewish followers of Jesus, including the deaths of numerous leaders of congregations and ministries in the Warsaw Ghetto, in the pogrom in Yassi in Romania, and being shot in the forests of Belarus and Lithuania. One particular situation was the deaths on one day of some 200 Jewish Christians in Helno. These were part of Leon Rosenberg's Bethel mission in Lodz or Wuj, as well as many from the Messiah's Chapel in Berlin. The bulk of the narrative, though, revolves around what was happening in Lvov, and in particular around how Basili, Anna, Pavel and his wife, Elizabeth, were trying to survive. To aid me in my understanding of Lvov, I've resorted to a book written by Rabbi David Kahana, entitled Lvov Ghetto Diary. Rabbi Kahana survived the Holocaust and later became the chief rabbi of the Israeli Air Force. He survived because of the courageous role played by the Greek Catholic Archbishop Andrei Sheptitsky, who at the risk of his own life harboured them as well as many other Jewish people. The strain upon those in hiding, including Basile and Anna, must have been immense. What is quite amazing also is that Anna somehow managed to hide a young girl, presumably a Jewish girl, also during this time, and she survived the Holocaust. Unfortunately, there was an informant who told the Gestapo about Basile, and he was arrested just a few months before the Soviets recaptured Lvov. It is not known what became of the Gentile Christian who had hidden Basile, but he too is certainly a hero. Apart from Anna, Pavel and Elisabetta, Elizabeth, I have not located evidence of what happened to the other Jewish Christians in Lvov. The majority of those associated with CMJ's work in Warsaw perished, including Victor Weissmann and his family. Victor was a close associate of Basile. There is evidence from some survivors from Warsaw. One of these wrote to Jacob after the war, stating, and I quote, I do not know what impression my letter would make upon you, 
but I can assure you that it is not a ghost who is writing, but a living person who regards Dante's hell as nothing compared with what has just taken place in our midst during the reign of the ingenious madman. But I am the same person who used to attend your services on Sundays. Pastor, I am so discouraged, and nothing will convey in human language my experiences, and yet there are others who suffered more. I can therefore modestly hold my peace. Another survivor whose father worked for CMJ sent a detailed letter with a graphic account of her experiences, including the death of her husband by starvation in the Warsaw Ghetto. But then she managed somehow to get into the Gentile side. This was a challenge because of her Jewishness. And she finally had to place her seven-year-old son in a Protestant orphanage. But she wrote, and I quote, unfortunately, after three months of stay there, he was discovered by the Gestapo and taken away forever. At the same time, in 1943, she wrote, the Warsaw Ghetto was liquidated and my mother found her death at the hands of the German Hitlerites. End of quote. All of the evangelical societies had similar reports. The Mild May Mission wrote, and I quote, First and foremost, there is the naked fact that six out of our seven workers in Poland and the Baltic countries have perished. They're all Jewish. The only survivor, Mr. R. Friedland of Warsaw, lost his young wife at the hands of guards. End of quote. It is very clear that the majority of the Hebrew Christians in Europe, and especially in Poland, never survived. Europe had the largest number of Jewish Christians pre-1939. It now seemed that alongside the Jewish community at large, the Hebrew Christian movement was gone. Many of the Holocaust survivors left Europe and established new lives for themselves, especially in Eretz Israel and in North America. Then the clear sign of Almighty God's covenant relationship with the nation of Israel was manifested on the 14th of May, 1948, when the state of Israel was proclaimed. Indeed, Am Israel Chai, the Jewish people live. Many Hebrew Christian survivors also left Europe, some going to Eretz Israel, but most, like Rachmiel Friedland, went to North America where he later became a Messianic rabbi. Jacob and Paul Yotch also went to North America, and they too became involved in the new and the emerging Messianic movement there. Jacob even became the president of the International Hebrew Christian Alliance, which today is named the International Messianic Jewish Alliance. The numbers of Jewish followers of Jesus is now higher than ever before in history. And in Israel itself, there are dozens of Hebrew-speaking Messianic congregations. The Nazi Hitlerites did not succeed in destroying the people of Israel, and they did not succeed in silencing the Hebrew Christian movement. Anna Yotch, although badly beaten and paralysed, from the waist downwards, lived to see the rebirth of both these entities from the ashes of the Holocaust. Then news arrived that she had received financial compensation from the German government. But Anna never received any such benefits as she died peacefully in Toronto on the 11th of December, 1961. As I've researched about Anna, the Yotch family, and the broader subject, I am left with a few personal questions or challenges. One is to do what I can do that ensure that the memories of those who were victims of the greatest crime in human history should never be forgotten. And that the ideas which gave birth to the Holocaust should be exposed and made known and challenged. Ideas have consequences. Another challenge relates to the character of the church, and I'm a part of the church. 
there should be no anti-Semitism in the true church. Anti-Semitism is contrary to the character of the true church. The true church is composed of Jew and Gentile, Aboriginal and white fellow, rich and poor, and all are one and equal in covenant relationship with Almighty God. Last Sunday, the collective Dutch Protestant church officially acknowledged their failure towards the Jewish people during the war. Late, but a step in the right direction. But perhaps the biggest challenge for me from this research study is this. How would I really have reacted in such a situation as these people faced back then? Would I have been like Archbishop Sheptitsky or the Roman Catholic Archbishop of the Netherlands, Johannes de Jong, who stood up to the Nazis, or the Polish Gentile Christian who risked his life to hide Basili Joc? I really don't know how I would have reacted if my life was endangered or the lives of my families. I would hope that I would have done the right thing. <laughs>